book in the back, give him a, a nod. <laughs> They're generally going like this. <laughs> All right, it's good to be with you. I'm, I am glad. I'm probably, I'm awfully glad pastor's back. So you kind of get out of the, the front seat, take a back seat. And uh, if anything happens that is not good, it will blame it on Maggie. Sister Maggie, that's a good idea that he raised that question. No, no, Sister Maggie, she, she's a sweetheart, good worker, as a number of you are here this morning. Glad to be with you. Take your Bibles, turn to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1, I give you, as we're turning there, I'll give you an update on mom. Mother did go through, my, mo- my mother did go through her surgery Friday. And it was a three-hour surgery. It was uh, a surgery that's, I guess, uh, kind of a common surgery. But you know, anytime you go through surgery, it's everybody wants to say, eh, it's fine, it's fine, you'll do fine. But, you know, complications can arise, especially when you're signing all those papers. If this happens, they're not liable. If that happens, they're not liable. You're like, wow. So long story short, she did get through it. They took three, I believe, three uh, pyrothyroid. I'm not a, a big on the medical into things, but she had glands. They took some of the glands out that didn't look right, had them sent off and uh, tested, and it all come back negative, which was good for her. And uh, so she's recovering. They released her yesterday, yesterday, Saturday, stayed over the overnight at the hospital. And so she's recovering and doing well. My sister, Jaina, who is also an R- RN, a nurse, and my, uh, my other sister, Brittany, who comes here uh, sometimes, she's a nurse. And so they're both taking care of her, of course, her mom's diet, cha- everything changes in the house. All the peanut butter goes, all the sugar goes when they show up. So, uh, of course, I don't tell them that I know where the stash is at. It's in dad's shop. No, no. <laughs> no, she'll, they get everything changed. Mom, you got to drink this. You got to eat this. And so they take care of her. And uh, she, she enjoys that. Gets to spend a little time with them as she recovers. So continue to pray for her. Also pray for those that we pray on a regular basis here. Uh, people battling uh, sicknesses and health, be with them. Get, they need strength. We will pray for them. God lift them up and, uh, and heal them if it be his will. And it always is that God try to heal and work through those situations, health situations. This morning, uh, as I uh, prayed and uh, began to look, Jonah, again, is one of my uh, minor prophets, one of my favorite minor prophets to look at. We're going to just do a lesson this morning on uh, kind of outlining the first part. We'll read verses 1 through 3 and then make some comments here about Jonah. We're going to look at Jonah's name quickly. We're going to look at uh, Jonah's negligence. And then we're going to look at Jonah's nation. Jonah's nation. And then Jonah's uh, notoriety. Last part. And uh, we'll try to make an application to us today. And the, the, the Bible says that the Old Testament was written for our, our admonition and learning. And it's to teach us. It's, a, it's a, a schoolmaster and to teach us. So we'll try to, to do that this morning. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. In verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof. Uh, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And so uh, some of the first things we, we notice here in verse 1, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai. He was the son of Amittai. And uh, some of these, these names in the Old Testament, as you read through the Old Testament, they have some really tough names uh, to say and pronounce. Sometimes people say, oh, it's, it's spelled like this or, or it's pronounced like that. I am not, uh, not a, an authority on that, but we call his name Amittai here. Uh, his name means truth. Jonah's father's name meant truth. That's what it means. Uh, so jo- Jonah was literally the son of truth, the son of truth. I want to show, we'll be looking at verses today. Turn to John chapter 14. I want to make this comment as we're turning over to John. That's St. John chapter 14. About being a son of truth. Every son of God is a son of truth. And, uh, you know, God has given his word, uh, and he demands that we be faithful with it in our lives. This is something that is, is openly taught in the New Testament. It doesn't take, uh, uh, you, you get the sense just reading the verses. We're going to look at some here. John chapter 14, notice with me in uh, John 14, verse 6, the verse 6 there. He said, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And while we're in John, let's uh, move forward there to chapter 17. Notice what he says here. Uh, I believe this is a prayer here of intercession. Or if you might please correctly, theologically, as would be the Lord's Prayer, what he prays. John chapter 17, verse 14 through 18. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world. And we shouldn't be, as Christians, we shouldn't be of the world. We're not, by the way, because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou, thou shouldest keep uh, them from the evil. In verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. This morning, we're, if you're saved in here this morning, hopefully you are, you're a son or a daughter of truth. We have been given the message, the good news, uh, uh, that Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was buried, and that he rose again. And the, world, the world is full of lost people, and so not only was Jonah a son of truth, and literally, but we are a son of truth. We're children of God, a son of God, and the son of truth, you might say. But in this, looking at this, we see the son of truth, but not only that, we see the solution to the turmoil. Uh, there never has been, nor uh, will there ever be a problem that the preaching of God's word cannot solve. You say, man, that is a bold statement. It go, takes you farther out there. Listen and, and, and turn to Isaiah while we're there. I'll make these comments. And uh, sometimes I read them thinking, what was I thinking when I wrote it down? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 55 is what I'm after. We'll do a little Bible exercise turning to these verses. But notice with me, bear with me now as we uh, lay a little groundwork here. Isaiah chapter 55, notice with me in verse 10 and verses 11. Notice what the Bible says. For as the rain cometh down in the snow from heaven and returneth not hit, uh, thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth the bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Verse 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. And so you see that the word of God is quick, is powerful. I'm thinking of the verse, and I'm getting ahead of my notes here. I want to show you another one in Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah is after the book of Isaiah, so just move to forward there. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. We're looking at the, the I want to say the awesomeness, but the, the, the power of God's word. God give us his word, the truth, and we're to bear. We're to bring that to bear to the lost and dying world. We looked at Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, Jeremiah chapter 17. Notice with me in verse 9. It states this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it is the question, and that is true. Man often is unaware of his conditions or his need. The lost man especially, he's unaware of, some people are unaware of that, and so it takes the light or the truth to bring that to bear. Hebrews chapter 4, you'll, you, we will know this one. Turn to Hebrews chapter um, 4, verse 12. It says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so we're seeing the solution to the turmoil is to send truth. We're, we are truth bearers, uh, ambassadors, if you please, for Christ. And this is, what, this is what God was wanting Jonah to do to Nineveh. And he said, man, the, the word of the Lord coming to uh, Jonah there in our text. And he says, arise, go to Nineveh, Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. I can't help but think of not just Nineveh, but the nation that we live in today. I understand this nation uh, still professes that uh, we're under God, a Christian nation. And if you, if you compare our nation to the other nations in the world, that would make sense. We are a Christian nation, although that is, that is waning and it's not getting brighter or stronger. And then that's not due to the world. That's due to the Christians who, uh, who are apathetic. Who, it's, just, it's, it's part of the... Part of, Today, the last day, last day and age. But we see here that we're still, just like Jonah, was given a commission uh, to go forward. And he says, arise, go to Nineveh. 
And he tells us to arise and go and to be light bearers of the truth. So we see Jonah's negligence here, what he does. Does he actually go to Nineveh? Well, ultimately he does, but first, his first decision wasn't, he wasn't to go. Let me read my notes here, and then we'll turn to 2 Corinthians. Jonah was not very faithful to the truth he had received. It has been stated, the greatest homage we can pay to truth is to use it. The greatest homage we can pay to truth is to use it. And there's another statement, uh, brother, I believe Brother Getch, it's not original, but Brother Getch had said this, read one of his books right now, and he says, listen, he, said, he says this, he says, what you do with truth determines what you do with error. And it sounds good when you get good hard preaching, when you get good hard teaching, you, it's straight down the gun barrel, but what you do with it, with the truth, determines what you're going to do with error. Most, most Christians, most of us, just lay right there, we don't do anything with the truth. And we've been sent to give truth to the world. And they say, oh, I thought it was just the preachers. No, it's, it's not just the preachers. It's every one of us. Everyone's been given the call of, uh, to the ministry of reconciliation, connecting pe people back to Christ. Uh, let's look at a verse here. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Last chapter in uh, 2 Corinthians, verse 8, if we can do it with verse 8. It says, for this, we, for we can do nothing against truth, but for the truth. Uh, that's what that verse states, for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. And so it's important that when you're, when you're handed truth, especially from God's word, and that you do something with it. It's not to be left dormant. So we see here that Jonah, he, he didn't do anything with it. He actually went the opposite way. And we're, as we look at his negligence, we see a willful de de uh, deafness. <laughs> he, wasn't, he didn't, either didn't hear something right. When God said go, to, when, he, when God said go to Jonah, Jonah said no. And he said it with his actions. Uh, sadly, we often know exactly what God is saying uh, we know exactly what he wants us to do, but we will willfully turn a deaf ear. And I want to show you a couple verses to, uh, to help uh, bring that to bear. Peter, I believe it's 1 Peter. Let me see here. I might be 1 Peter chapter 5. Nope. Let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5, it says this, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. We see here that, notice the first part of that, for this they willingly are ignorant. That is, that is a self, see, that is willingly want to be ignorant in certain matters or, or certain subjects. Here, we're talking, we're wanting to apply it to ourselves, it's not good for us to be willingly ignorant of truth. That means we hear the truth, but we don't do anything with the truth. And so this is where Jonah was at. And uh, he was headed for some rough times. Think of the verse back in Jeremiah. He said, man, you're really making me turn this morning. Well, that I am. I have to turn to Jeremiah chapter 5. You think of these verses, you run these verses down, then you get to look at them, you have about 300. I mean, like, oh my, this is not going to work. We'll be turning all morning. Jeremiah chapter 5, these verses go along with what we're saying here. He says, hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. They were there, they were present, but God was telling them, look, you, yeah, you're listening, but you're not doing, you're not doing. And so you're doing the opposite. And so that's what Jeremiah 521, I said 512, it's 521 is what I just read. So we see a willful deafness, a willful disaster. Willful disaster, disobedience never has a happy ending. And you can go through the Bible, I think of Adam. Uh, Adam and Eve disobeyed in the garden. You could ask Adam about that. You can ask Cain. You could go on down the list. You can ask Cain. He murdered his brother, his younger brother. You can ask Achan, uh, and then you can ask Samson. All these, all, all these people had trouble with looking at something and lusting after it. Uh, Adam or Cain might be a little bit different there, but he said rose up with great anger. 
And so he might be an exception there. But Achan, I know he says, he says, I saw and I took. Eve, she saw that the fruit was good. And uh, then you have Samson, he saw a woman where he shouldn't have been. And uh, he said, I saw the woman and I wanted her. And he went back and told his father, but I said, I want you to get her for me. And so he had a problem. David was the other man I'm thinking of. He was on the rooftop and he looked and he saw. And so uh, we're led away uh, when we're enticed. And then when love hath conceived it, bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And so uh, let me show you another you know, woeful disaster. Notice what happens here when we begin to disobey. We see this progression here in Jonah. We know this story very well, but let's, let's run some verses uh, more. 1 Samuel, go to the front. Uh, 1 Samuel, I believe I want ver, uh, chapter 15. 1 Samuel, we want to look at what's, what Saul and uh, Samuel says to uh, Saul, King Saul. And we're familiar with this portion of Scripture. 1 Samuel, I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verses uh, 22, I believe, will work. He says here, and Samuel said, this is the prophet Samuel speaking to uh, King Saul. He says here, uh, let's, see, uh, let's see here, he says in Samuel, it's 22, yeah, verse 22. And Samuel said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? And it was a question, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. And so basically what he was laying out to King Saul is Saul thought, eh, yeah, I know what God, God uh, told me to kill everything. But he got to looking at the king, got to looking at some of the prized sheep and the, the, the livestock there. And so he kept back some and his, his thinking was, well, I'll sacrifice it to God. God will be pleased with that. And so Samuel says, look, uh, yeah, what you're thinking, but that's not what God told you to do. And he tells him simply to obey is better than sacrifice. Simply obey is far better than to sacrifice. He thought sacrificing Saul, King Saul, was better than obeying the voice of the Lord. And here, back in Jonah, uh, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. He said, arise, uh, Jonah, go unto Nineveh and preach against it. And Jonah, man, he... <laughs> He didn't, he didn't head that way, and so off are we today. God says, look, I want you to go across the way and say something to your neighbor or say something to this person over here or give a track to this person or knock on that door or make a cake for this person uh, uh, or whatever the case may be. God speaks to you as to all of us a little bit differently, but I do know this is commissioned in the Bible that we're to go, go with truth and go with life. And so here we're seeing with Jonah, the disaster that begins to take place. Jonah's disobedience eventually brought about a storm that impacted many. A lot of people believe, well, if I sin uh, or disobey God, I'm just doing it for myself and it don't affect anybody else. If I sin by myself, you know, it's just on me. It never works that way. The Bible says no man liveth unto himself and no man dieth unto himself. And it always affects somebody else. So we'll move to number three, Jonah's nation. Jonah's nation. God has saved you and I and left us here on this earth for a reason. And here, here's, let me give you a verse for this, this reason. We do, there's a purpose for you being here. John, I'm, I'm running to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. By, by the end of this, this Sunday school, you'll know how to turn in your, your Bible. John chapter 15, verse 16. John chapter 15, verse 16, it says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. I've written in my notes here, God has saved us and left us here for a purpose. God didn't just save us to set, soak, and sour. He saved us, and I said this the other evening in a message, stand and strive and serve. That's what he saved us to do, to stand, Ephesians chapter 6, to strive, Philippians, and to serve. And you say, well, where are we at with this? I don't know. I'm just putting it out. I'm just putting it out. I know in my life there's been times when I have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I'm thinking even when he had called me to preach and I had not yet surrendered, 
uh, and there had been two years that God was dealing with my heart about that call to preach, the surrender to preach. And I was scared. I didn't, you know, I, it was the last thing I wanted to do. I figured my father, my older brother, I think even my younger brother had already surrendered to, to preach. I, they didn't need another preacher. And it, what was I going to, you know, it's no big deal. We're fine. I would happily go to church, happily do my thing at church. But I was more interested in business, business things, business matters, and uh, making a profit on that. I thought that's what I was going to do. God had other plans, and they weren't my plans. And so here I am this morning trying to obey the word of the Lord. But God will bring you, he will bring you to that decision. You say, well, does God, does he, is a kind of doubt? But God is very clear. When he speaks to you, when he lays something on your heart, uh, he's not unclear. He's very clear. And it'll ring like a bell, crystal clear. It will make sense, and it will always line up with his word, not contrary to his word. We know that it doesn't work contrary to God's word. And so God calls, still calls men, and not very, not very noble, not very educated. Uh, matter of fact, the lowest, the way you said, like scraping the bottom of the barrel. Then that's when, <laughs> that's when I got called. So uh, that's where we're at. But we notice here, looking back at, back at Jonah, Jonah's nation and what he begins to do. And uh, look at this, uh, the nemesis of indifference. The nemesis of indifference. God reveals how repugnant of apathy is when he scalds the church in Laodicea, at Laodicea. It wasn't the name of the church, but that's where the church was at. Notice with me in Revelation chapter 3. See, we're turning again. Oh, yes. Revelation chapter 3. In verse 15 and 19, notice with me here, we need to be familiar with especially this portion. We don't want to fall into this, uh, this type of a church. And I, by the way, I don't think we really are. I think we will have factions in it from time to time. Some days we're spiritually strong, other days we're spiritually weak, and man, it's, uh, it's a battle. But notice what he says about this church collectively as a whole. Revelation chapter 3, I'm looking at verses 15 through 19. He says, I know thy works. This is God speaking here, that thou art neither hot nor cold, speaking of this, uh, uh, this church here, I would that thou wert cold or hot. He said, look, I'd rather you be either cold, totally cold, or hot, on fire. But they wasn't. They were lukewarm. They had, they had pretty much faithfulness down. They had everything down, but they were missing some things. He's, gonna, he's going to bring them out. He says here, he's in verse 16, so then uh, because thou art lukewarm, he said, because of your state, because of actually where you're at, he, he tell them where they're at, and neither cold nor hot, I would spew thee out of my mouth. Uh, he's kind of, what basically I'm reading it is, he said, this is, my, this is what I want to do. This is where you're at. He said, this is what it makes me want to do. You know, spew out of my mouth. Not, no, you no use of nothing. It's kind of like taking... Uh, a drink of something that you're expecting to be hot or expect to be really cold and it's kind of lukewarm and it, man, you ever grab iced tea thinking it was iced tea and it's apple juice? Man, or vice versa. Uh, and you're like, oh, you want to spit it out. And there's been times when you've spit it out. Have you ever drank something thinking it was something and then spit it out because you know, I don't know what was in this thing. That's kind of what God is saying. So this, is, this is my reaction of a lukewarm state. Okay? Because uh, thou sayest, and he says, this is the reason why, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. This is this church stating this. And oh, it's a dangerous ground that a church, uh, a called out assembly gets in this state because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. They cannot see the condition that they're in. That's why a preacher sometimes will get up and preach and people sometimes get offended at it because they get a short glimpse of really where they're at, of the situation that they're at. And we're speaking collectively here. You could apply this uh, personally. We're verse 18, we're going to 19. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. They were definitely blind. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I believe, uh, and I, I keep saying that because of Scripture concludes, he says, I, I rebuke and chasten. That's the spewing out of the mouth. God has the ability and does, according to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, to discipline, to chasten uh, his children. 
And he does it to bring you back, not to totally do away with you. He wants to draw you back. And so you see here this state in Laodicea, God reveals this, what he thinks of apathy. That's why we preach and teach that apathy is not a good thing. Let me state this uh, of, of apathy, and this is a quote, and I need to begin to wind down here. Martin Niemroller stated this about the Second World War uh, uh, era. In Germany, he was, and this is what he said, in Germany, they came first for the communists. And I didn't speak up because I wasn't communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was Protestant. Then they came for me, and by that time, no one was left to speak up. That's about where the church is at. Ah, well, and we have let uh, things slide in our world. That's why the world is growing darker and darker. Christians aren't speaking up. Uh, we have more Jonahs, if you please, <laughs> on boats headed the opposite direction than when God has told them to do. Uh, you know, God has chosen us to, to stand up and to do something for him. So he's definitely not for apathy if we're getting that in our appetite. The necessity of involvement. Let me say this. We are our brother's keepers. We are all missionaries, every one of us. We think, well, I thought a missionary had... Listen, we're, we have... A, every one of us has a field uh, of people and relationships that we know of that we can minister in. Uh, and every person we meet is a candidate for the gospel. Every person. I'm thinking of Ezekiel. Let's see if I can find it in my Bible. Ezekiel. I'm wanting verse 33. Ezekiel, or chapter 33, Ezekiel 33, verse 8, it says, When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require it at thy hand. It's speaking of a day that God will bring it back into remembrance when we should have went forward and shared the gospel or the good news with somebody, but we didn't. So we're talking about the necessity of involvement. Jonah definitely didn't want to be involved with the people at Nineveh. And if you did uh, some study, you would, you, you, there were some pretty good logical reasons why he didn't, and neither one of us would want to go there. But let me say this about the Great Commission. Uh, the Great Commission is not a suggestion, it's a mandate. Just like Jonah, we may not think that the world deserves the message but we must remember that God loves the world. Every child of God is an ambassador for Christ. So we see Jonah's notoriety. Sadly, Jonah was remembered for his disobedience, not the great revival that he brought to Nineveh. By the way, that great revival was brought, but only through the hand of God in what God told Jonah to preach, which, by the way, I believe it was an eight-word message. That, that's pretty short. <laughs> long-winded messaging but uh, here he preached that but he's noted for his disobedience that's what we're looking at this morning and so uh, you know none of us would not exactly uh, want the the average person wouldn't want that on his resume noted for his disobedience that probably would keep you from getting a, a job uh, if your life ended today we get on a serious note here for what would you be remembered would there be people in heaven because of you? Or would there be people in hell because of you? And so I, I know we can look at this, we look back, we look at what Jonah did, what he didn't do, what he did do ultimately. But the question is going to apply to us this morning, what, what are we doing? Are we allowing people to slip through the cracks, the opportunities that God has given us and we ignore it? We're so, we're so dull in our spiritual life that that we're not able to see the opportunities that God gives us. I was thinking, I was talking with my brother and the other day, and he said, you know, we were praying most of the day that God give me an opportunity to witness to somebody. And he got in a, uh, in a certain situation. He was uh, uh, doing something, and uh, a man walked up, got off his motorcycle bike, walked up, pretty nice-looking man, and he said, hey, you need help. I said, yeah, I need help. And uh, so uh, he helped him out there for a few minutes. He says, man, I really, it was fishing. He was fishing. He was trying to get his boat out, and the man said, I would really like to go fishing. How's the fishing in this lake? Just kind of moved here. And Todd said, well, I, don't, I haven't, you should, I, you, I'm not the one to ask you. I haven't caught any fish here. So I don't know. 
to be, be honest with you. And he got to chatting with the guy. And the guy was wide open. And Todd said that I let the guy turn around and walk back to his boat. We said our goodbye. And he drove off. Todd said, man, and it didn't hit me until after that was over that there was an opportunity to take that man out fishing because the guy apparently was a pretty good fisherman or so he said, give him a try. And that would have been an opportunity to develop a relationship to ultimately witness to the man. So it can happen to any of us. I've done the very same thing. And it's sad. You're like, man, I missed that opportunity. I was thinking of self, thinking of something else. And uh, Jonah, so when we look at Jonah, don't, don't run him down too far. He's just like you and I. So we see the legacy of disobedience. I've got about two or three minutes here. Obedience to God has a long-range ramification. Uh, uh, and it, it, it is, and it has a positive and a productive side of it. While disobedience leaves a tough stain that is rarely removed, uh, and, and you can look at this in Isaiah 119, but Isaiah 118 is the verse. Right before that, it speaks of uh, being changed and being cleansed uh, of, your, of your sins. That's, that's a reference is Isaiah 1, chapter 1, and verse 19 and 18. Let me move on. Though a lesson in decisions, what can we learn from the life of Jonah? There is a law in life called the law of cause and effect. Nothing just happens. Every decision determines a direction. You may, not, uh, you, know, you may not turn 180 degrees away from the will of God today. See, we're not dealing with Christians who are actually 180 degrees turned of God's direction, but they're turned about one or two degrees off to the left or to the right. And so what that happens, if you're one or two degrees away from the complete obedience and will of God, it causes you to miss God's, uh, at the end of this thing, by miles, you'll be off. And uh, well, let me show you a verse, Deuteronomy. This will be my last one. We'll close. Go all the way back to Deuteronomy. And this is, you know, just, hey, well, it's just a little lie. Or, I don't totally commit it. God wants full obedience, and we're going to look at a verse here. Now, I'm talking to Christians this morning, Christians who are understanding and have the Holy Spirit bearing witness. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19. Notice with me here, and we'll end. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. In verse 20, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God with that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him for he is thy life and the length of thy days that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, uh, to give them. And so we are commissioned to live in truth this morning. Uh, we were looking at Jonah and then we uh, had looked at where he's at and what he did. Let's not do the same thing. Let's hearken to the voice of the Lord and obey uh, obey is, is better than sacrifice. Let's all stand. We're going to end there for Sunday school.